The message for today is undressing a well-dressed lie. Okay? Undressing a well-dressed lie. Many years ago, my dad, and when I say my dad, I mean my uncle, really, who raised me. He was my father image in my life. Many years ago, he told me about an allegory. What did I just say? An allegory, which means that what he shared with me did not really happen, but it is a story concept to teach a lesson. He shared with me this allegory about the truth and the lie going swimming. Some of you might have heard that before. That the truth and the lie were out swimming one day. And the lie said to the truth, let me see how far you can swim underwater. So while truth was underwater swimming, lie took advantage of the time that the truth couldn't see what was going on and jumped out of the water and grabbed his clothes, grabbed truth's clothes, and put them on and went running down the street. So people who saw the lie with truth's clothes on running down the street said, that looked like the truth. <laughs> running down the street. In the meantime, Truth got out and saw that La had taken his clothes and gave chase after the lie. And the folks saw Truth come running down the street a little bit later and said, yeah, but here come the naked Truth. <laughs> is truth eventually caught up with the lie. And when truth caught up with the lie, truth began to undress the lie to get his clothes back. Now, let's take this same allegory and put it in a time frame. So you're not just looking at an allegory, but Let's see the applicability of this allegory. From somewhere around 500 years AD to about 1500 years AD, about a 1,000 year period, the Roman Catholic Church, Europeans, the Roman Empire, Greco-Roman Empire. For almost 1,000 years, they hid the truth. They suppressed the truth. They reconstructed the truth. They reshaped the truth. They plagiarized the truth. All for the purpose of introducing what they did as a well-dressed lie. Right. Brothers and sisters, in ancient times, Europe, meaning the Greeks and the Romans, loved and even practiced the African system of spirituality. In fact, the whole world knew that the only system of spirituality was the African system of spirituality. However, for the sake of power and control, the Roman Empire, under the disguise of what is now called the Roman Catholic Church, right instituted a program a 
of rulership for the Christianizing of the European mind and subsequently the African mind. This program that the Roman Catholic Church instituted was called the Dark Ages. Historians refer to it as medieval Europe. As long as the world was conscious of the greatness of the spirituality of African people, the Euro-Gentile Roman Catholic Church, and when I say the Roman Catholic Church, brothers and sisters, that's just the modern day version of the Roman Empire. Roman Empire still exists, it's just now called the Roman Catholic Church, that's all. The Roman Catholic Church or Empire could not secure and maintain control over the masses as long as the world was conscious of the spirituality of African people. Uh -huh. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So what did they have to do? The Roman Catholic Church, the Greco-Romans, had to literally eradicate uh -huh. all visible traces of the wisdom of the ancient African teachings. Therefore, Europe was deliberately and intentionally forced into what is known as the Dark Ages for the sole purpose, for the sole purpose of removing from Europe the awareness and memory of Africa and its greatness. Y'all following what I'm saying? The result was to eternally fuel the flames of racism and portray Africa as a pagan, savage, satanic, and lost culture that needed to be saved by a redeemer that was conceived in the minds of a group of Catholic bishops and birthed at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 AD. That's some deep stuff. Here you have a people that everything the world knows it got from them. And now the Roman Catholic Church wants to portray these people and their culture as satanic, evil, ungodly, pagan, and in need of a savior. And what's deep about it is it looked like if they wanted to say you need a savior, it looked like they would have at least gotten a savior that was the same color as those people. Wanted to do. Their savior had to look like them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now follow this. This savior that they created was given birth uh -huh. in the fourth century. Mm -hmm. I know many of you who grew up Bible-based don't understand that and have a hard time believing that. No, no, no. Uh-uh, no. What do you mean in the fourth century? No. No, Jesus came along in the first century. See, that's the lie. Yeah. The best dressed lie in the history of the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. From 325 AD, over the next, now follow this timeline here. Follow this time frame. Yeah. Over the next 126 years, the Roman Catholic Church would hold council meetings to literally manufacture and institute a religion that became, became the best dressed lie in the history of the world. That religion is what we now know today as Christianity. I know that slaps some of us. Believe it or not, even though I know better, 
I still feel the repercussion of it myself when I say it. Because so much of my life was spent into the best dressed lie that the world has ever known. The Council of Nicaea in the year 325 AD lasted for two months and 12 days. 318 Catholic bishops were present. There's a creed that comes from this council. Many of you who have studied theology or whatever, you may know it as the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was actually established to create in the minds of the masses that Jesus is in fact not only the Son of God, but God. And also the fixing and keeping of the date of Easter was all established at the Nicene Council. Let me read to you, some of you may already know this, but others of you may not. So let me read to you the Nicene Creed, which was again made up in the fourth century. Here's what it says. We believe in one God, the Father of all, maker of all things, both seen and unseen. That's fine, isn't it? Yeah, see, that's how they catch you, y'all. That's, that's the whole thing about hooking you with the right bait. That opening sentence is the truth. It's the second sentence where they inject their error. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son, capital S-O-N, of God, the only begotten, begotten from the Father, that is from the substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Begotten, not made. With the Father, through whom and for our salvation, he came down and became incarnate, became human. Y'all hear this? <laughs> Suffered and rose up on the third day, went up into the heavens, is coming to judge the living and the dead and in the Holy Spirit. And that was the end of the Nicene Creed until they had to go back and add some more to it. Mm -hmm. Later on, they had a council to declare the divinity of the Holy Ghost. Now, this first council was in 325 A.D. You with me? Look at these dates, y'all. 56 years later, they had to hold another council meeting because their lie wasn't complete. It still had some holes in it. So they held another council meeting in 381 A.D. called the First Council of Constantinople, named after Constantine. and Emperor Theodosius I was at this council and spearheaded. It was attended by 150 bishops and it was at this council that they had to come up with the doctrine making the Holy Spirit God. Now mind you now, at the Council of Nicaea they made Jesus God. Now they understand God is already God. The creator of all, right? So they had to make up this trinity, but they couldn't do it all at one time, and they had to keep going back and adding on and adding on. So in 381, they came up with the first council of Constantinople, where they came up with the doctrine of what we call in theology today, pneumatology. Uh -huh. The study of the Holy Spirit. At the Council of Constantinople, they added to the Nicene Creed that they made up in 325 AD. And here's the rest of what they added to the Nicene Creed. It says, and those who say there was once when he was not, 
and before he was begotten he was not, and that he came from things that were not, or from another hypostasis or substance, affirming that the Son of God is subject to change or alteration, these, the Catholic and Apostolic Church, anathematizes. I love the way they use that word. They use that word, we anathematize you, like folk really knew what it meant. And guess what, y'all? Some people today still don't know what it means. Now, I'm going to tell you why I say that. Because the anathematization of a person means that this particular organization or group has cast you out. Not only have they cast you out, but they have also put out a death warrant on you. People don't want to be anathematized. So therefore, they try to do everything they can to comply with the wishes of the Roman Catholic Church. Do y'all not know that the Roman Catholic Church has trained us so well that right now today, we still carry out anathematizing somebody if they don't fit in with what we think they ought to believe. Y'all didn't catch what I just said. If somebody comes up to you with a different doctrine than you believe, you want to anathematize them. You want to put them down. You want to destroy them. You want to call them the Antichrist. You want to call them, you a, no, you ain't really a child of God. Look at the person next to you and say, who gave you the right to decide who God accepts and who God rejects? Well, as though that wasn't enough, 50 years later, just 50 years later, after the council, first council of Constantinople, they had another council meeting called the Council of Ephesus. Sounds familiar? Yeah. This was in 431 AD. Now, why do they keep holding these council meetings? Because they still got that. There you go. See, remember now that the lie is dressing up here. You follow what I'm saying? They got to go back and be, see, in other words, you know, you know, have you ever been shopping and bought a suit or a dress, and then when you went to put it on, it, it, it wasn't fitting exactly right? Oh, no, 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 the pants are too short, you know? Oh, no, no, you, you ain't taking up enough, or the sleeves are too long, da, 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 da. Well, see, this is what happens when you fabricate a belief system. When people go to put it on, it doesn't fit. So in 431, the Council of Ephesus, attended by more than 200 Catholic bishops, they had, they had the responsibility of not only coming up with a doctrine to promote what is called the triune God. You know, y'all heard that doctrine before, right? One for the Father, two for the Son, three for the Holy Ghost. They all make? One. There you go. The triune or unity of the Godhead was fabricated at the Council of Ephesus. And not only that, another thing was done at the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. This lady named Mary. The Catholic Church decreed at the Council of Ephesus that Mary was Jesus' mother. And not only was she his mother, but she is also the quote title that the Catholic Church uses, the mother of God. Came into existence at the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. And of course they added it in their prayer thereafter, Holy Mary, what? Mother of God. That's some deep stuff, man. A human being. The mother of God. Now, what year was this again? 431, right? Now, mind you, the Dark Ages began in the year 500. So do y'all see the build up here? It's called putting stuff in place, y'all. Now, after the Council of Ephesus in 431, the Roman Catholic Church met with resistance. But 
they didn't meet with resistance from Africans. They met with resistance from some other white folk. They couldn't have that. You see, there were some white people who had learned the ways of the African value system and spirituality of the Africans. These white folk lived in Ireland and they were called the Druids. So after the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD, the Druids, white folk, started telling everybody these other white folk ain't telling y'all the truth. And the Roman Catholic Church could not afford to let that happen. So the same Pope that oversaw the Council of Ephesus, Pope Celestine I, in 431 AD at the Council of Ephesus, one year later in 432 AD, went and got an ex-British slave whose name was Patrick and commissioned him and gave him military support to go into Ireland and get rid of these white people who won't stand down. Follow this thing here now. I want you, Patrick, to go into Ireland and of course we were taught in history that Patrick went into Ireland to get rid of the snake people. In fact, he is traditionally known as the man who drove the snakes out of Ireland. And everybody, especially if you hate snakes, you appreciate Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland. And you know we don't like snakes. So therefore, when you hear that Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland, you say, oh, that's, he did a good thing. Well, no, he did not do a good thing. Because actually, he didn't drive no snakes out of Ireland, people. He drove the druids yes, yes. who happened to wear the headdress of the ancient Camite people with the cold on the front, or the uraeus it was called. So because they wore the cobra on their headdress, they were called the snake people. They weren't snake people, they were white people who had learned African spirituality. Patrick went in under the auspices of the Roman Catholic Church, sanctioned by Pope Celestine I, and drove the Druids out of Ireland. How did he do them? By driving them into the water? No, he didn't drive them into the water. He slaughtered yes. hundreds of thousands of their own people. Yes. White folk that look like them. Yes. Look at the person next to you and say, that's their nature. <laughs> they will kill their own yes. to have their way. Yes. Slaughter these Druids because as long as they were alive, they were a formidable resistance against the Roman Catholics program. So he drove them out and set up over 300 churches, Catholic churches of course. Guess people say, why are you so hard against Catholicism? Because they're the ones who created this mess. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just acknowledging what they did. I really don't give a cheesecake about Catholic Church. But see, brothers and sisters, you have to, I, I got to undress the lie. You understand what I'm saying? So they, he drove them out and, and established over 300 churches and guess what Pope Celestine did? He honored this man and canonized him a saint. A mass murderer. The Roman Catholic Church decreed him a saint. And right now, every year, your children go to school and make these little green, what do you call them, shamlocks or 
shamrocks, walking down the street with a green shamrock hat on, celebrating a mass murder on St. Patrick's Day. Next time you see your child getting ready to participate, educate them. Help them understand that you are celebrating a mass murderer, baby. Don't make that stuff. And if the school tries to make them make it, let us know. Oh, like that wasn't enough. After the Druid massacre, the resistance of other Europeans was out the way. So now they had to do one more thing. And 451 AD, 19 years later, after the Druid massacre, they held another council meeting called the Council of Chalcedon. Oh, brothers and sisters, y'all gotta understand. We got, we, I got to undress this lie and show you that it is not as good looking as it wants to make you believe it is. You ever see folk who look good when they're dressed up? You know, it would be like the man who saw this sister at a banquet. He said, oh my God, she looked good. Woo! Lost his mind. She was shaped just right. Hair, teeth looked like a set of pearls. Eyes glimmered when he looked at her. Got to know her a little better. Asked her to marry him. He was very impressed. After the reception, got to the honeymoon suite. Sister pulled those pearls out of her mouth. She put them in a denture plate dish. She reached up in her eyes and took out those dream eyes that he had been looking in. She reached down in her outfit and snatched out those hips that had her so shapely. And the hair that looked like strings of silk, she pulled it out and set it down. And she stepped out and said, Dada! Brother ran out the room. <laughs> can be dressed in such a way to as you want it. Then God has to send somebody to undress the lie so you can see it for what it really is. And ain't nothing as bad as to understand how something really looks after you done asked it to marry you. Bad state to be in. <laughs> you done said for better or for worse now. You didn't know the worst was coming that quick though, did you? <laughs> At the Council of Chalcedon in 451, 150 bishops under the leadership of another pope, Pope Leo. This council was to kind of put pretty much the lie in place by actually defining that not only was Jesus Christ the Son of God, but it was at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD that the Roman Catholic Church came up with the doctrine that Jesus is truly a human being and truly God. In theology and seminary, Bible college, we're taught that it is the dual nature of Christ. The 
that's some deep stuff, man. You know, I think back to all that training they put in my head and all while I was being programmed, I never stopped to ask, when did this come into existence? I just accepted the appearance of the lie that it always was. At the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, these Roman Catholic bishops made a decree. I want to read an excerpt of their decree to you. Here's what it says, and I quote, Since we have formulated these things with all possible accuracy and attention, this sacred and universal synod decrees that no one is permitted to produce or even to write down or compose any other creed or to think or teach otherwise. <laughs> Did y'all grab what I just said? Look at the person next to you and say, now that's control. <laughs> Let me read it to you one more time. In fact, I'm going to just get right to what I have in bold letters here. They decreed at the Council of Chalcedon, Roman Catholic Church, in 451 AD, it says that no one is permitted to produce or even to write down or compose any other creed or to think or teach otherwise. goes on to say what will happen. Now check this out. This is some deep stuff, y'all. It says, as for those who dare either to compose another creed or even to promulgate or teach or hand down another creed, check this out now, for those who wish to convert to a recognition of the truth. See, you need to have this so you can see it yourself. You know, what I encourage you to do is go on the internet, pull up Council of Chalcedon. That's spelled C-H-A-L-C-E-D-O-N. Council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L of Chalcedon. And you can read this for yourself, it's right there. And it says that anybody who tries to teach another creed for those who wish to convert to a recognition of the truth. Uh -huh. And that right there tells you they know they lie. Right That's right here, people. For those who wish to convert to a recognition of the truth from Hellenism or from Judaism. If they be bishops or clerics, the bishops are to be deposed from the episcopacy and the clerics from the clergy, if they be monks or lay folks, they are to be anathematized. So what that's saying here is if somebody wants, if somebody walks up and says, listen, I want to look into some other concepts here. I want to verify if this is true or not. And somebody says, okay, well, let me help you examine all of the evidences out there. It says you can't even do that. Somebody who's looking for the truth, you can't even help them find the truth. That's some deep stuff. Yes. I say. Undress that lie, Pastor. Come on. I'm trying to take the clothes off of it. Come on. So you can understand this thing, people, because we have been messed with. Yes. We have been hoodwinked. Yes. Gotta get nice, you know. And it's deep because, you know, I, as I was listening to our brother this morning in the studio, and I, if y'all might have heard me, I said, brother, what brought about your consciousness? Because you grew up here in St. Louis. <laughs> and y'all think I'm lying. See, y'all are from here, so you don't really grab the, the depth of what I'm telling you. But I ain't seen a city like this one. I ain't lying. I have never seen a place like this. The spirit of Catholicism got black folk here messed up. Yes. Brother blew my 
of mine. He was raised and uh, grew up in the Catholic Church, and they were sending him to be a priest. But somebody undressed the law. Somebody undressed the law, and the Catholic Church lost. Um, what would have been a warrior for Catholicism. Right. Well, brothers and sisters, follow this now. Here we got 451, Council of Chalcedon, where they made this ruling that nobody can even think something other than what the Roman Catholic Church said is. For the next 1,000 years, the Roman Catholic Church seized and impounded the truth from the masses. In fact, guess what, y'all? The only people who were allowed to have books were the Catholic priests. The Catholic priests said they will dispense to the masses what they think the masses need to know. Y'all follow me? Yes, yes. The Roman Catholic Church had actually created an absence of reliable historical information. It was during this period, during this period, that something called the transatlantic slave trade kicked in. Oh, yeah, let me tie this thing in here now so you can really see how we've been messed over. Everybody say the great rebirth. Great now, what in the world is that, Pastor? Well, about 1500 AD, the Europeans had what they called the Great Rebirth. Hear this now. The Great Rebirth. The French had a word for it, and it's called Renaissance. After the Roman Catholic Church, had formulated the best dress lie in the history of the world, they now were ready to present their lie through a program called the Renaissance. Renaissance is the name of the so-called great intellectual and cultural movement of a created interest no longer in Africa, but now the focus of created interest was Europe. You see, 1,000 years earlier, it was all about Africa. Even white folk loved Africa. They still do. Yes, they do. They still do. All you got to do is turn on Discovery Channel or TLC, and you'll see them right now in Africa, still over there trying to find the answer to why they exist. That's what it's about, people. And what's deep about it is it amazes me how they can go into Africa and, and rob the graves, invade the bur sacred burial places of our ancestors. I have not seen yet anybody going up in Europe, opening up no ancient graves. What do you think would happen, y'all, if we tried to go up in Europe and open up some graves? What do you think would happen if we tried to go open up the graves of, of, of the ancestors of Queen Elizabeth? What do you think would happen? Now, you've been with it. You won't even live to get arrested, brother. How dare you desecrate an evil grave like that? Here, they want to go on holy ground. Yes, yes. Now, I can call it holy ground. Because I've been there. And not only was I there, even the Bible calls it holy ground. According to the biblical record, God told Moses, take off your shoes. Because the ground you stand on is holy. And let me tell y'all, Moses was not in Europe. If he had existed. Libraries. Now mind you. After this 1,000 year period of restructuring the truth, after this 1,000 year period of, of, of hiding and suppressing the truth and plagiarizing it and, and introducing their best dressed lie, 
Libraries were founded on the best dressed lie of European religious, philosophical, and cultural supremacy. Schools for the study of Greek and Latin in their classic forms were opened at Rome and Matua and Verona and many other towns so they could teach the best dressed lie. Pope Nicholas V spearheaded a new movement and laid the foundation of the great Vatican collection, it's called, based on the best dressed lie in the history of the world. Everybody say the Augsburg Confession. Now, this took place in 1530, y'all. 1530, what year did I just say? 1530. In the year 1530, we have what's called the Augsburg Confession. Keep in mind, I said 1530. What year did the Bible that y'all carried come out? 1611, exactly. So you see, y'all, how this whole program was put in place. So by the time King Jimmy came along <laughs> and ordered the printing of his Bible. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell y'all about the Gutenberg, Gutenberg printing press, which was found, which was made in 1445. So you got to understand, the Gutenberg printing press, even though it's a German name, y'all, Gutenberg was a German Catholic under the influence of the Roman Catholic Church. So they use his printing presses to dispense their lie. In 1530, Charles V, emperor of the Roman Empire, called the princes and cities of the German territories at Augsburg together. There was a guy by the name of Philip Melanchthon. Philip Melanchthon, spelling is M-E-L-A-N-C-H-T-H-O-N. -H -H By the way, Philip was a very good friend of a guy named Martin Luther. I ain't talking about Martin Luther King either. I said 1530, y'all. The white guy who they didn't know no better and they named Dr. Martin Luther King after him. Ain't that deep? <laughs> they thought their parents, his parents didn't know no better, you know. Philip was called upon by Charles V, Emperor of the Roman Empire, check this out, y'all, to draft a confession. To draft a confession that would be implemented as doctrine. It's called the Augsburg, A-U-G-S-B-U-R-G. A-U-G-S-B-U-R-G, the Augsburg Confession. Go to the internet, look it up, and see what comes up, and here's what it says. This confession that this one man named Philip Melanchthon wrote and put it together and gave it to the emperor, and here's what it says. I'm just gonna read some excerpts from it. It says, most invincible emperor, Caesar Augustus, most clement lord, inasmuch as your imperial majesty has summoned us here to Augsburg, that, check this out now, that we would submit the articles of our confession from our side on next Wednesday, therefore in obedience to your imperial majesty's wishes, we offer in this matter of religion the confession of our preachers all right, all right. and of ourselves showing what manner of doctrine from the Holy Scriptures has been up to this time and taught in our churches. According to the said imperial proposition, check this, check this out. Got to catch myself. <laughs> I said that, I felt my face say, yeah. <laughs> check this out, people. According to the said imperial proposition, we ought to confess the one Christ. 
after the tenor of your imperial majesty's edict. That's some deep stuff. When the emperor says, this is what you better write in that confession. That's it. And you write it. Don't take my word for it. Go read it for yourself. And undress the lie in your own mind. Yes, yes. You see, brothers and sisters, with this kind of lie dressed up, see, most of us don't know anything about the clothes the article of clothing that I just described to y'all. Most of our people don't know the first thing about the first council of Constantinople. Most of our people don't know anything about the council of Nicaea. Most of our people don't know anything about the council of Ephesus. And yet they want to get on, on the radio and confront you and tell you you don't know what you're talking about. Don't know anything about the Druids massacre. Don't know anything about the council of Chalcedon. All of these articles of the lie don't know anything about the, the, the whole program of, of the, the, the Dark Ages or the Augsburg Confession. When all this stuff was put in place hundreds of years ago and then you are born into it. Yes, yes. You think that which your parents gave you is the truth. Yes. Because their parents gave them the lie whose parents gave them the lie. In fact, y'all, when they snatched us out of Africa, they gave us the lie. Yes. The lie has been running all over the world for centuries. And a lot of you who have grown up with the lie just like in the analogy I started out with, some of you said, that looks like the truth. And that's why you accepted it. Because it looked like the truth, even though in your African selves, many of you knew something wasn't right with it. But you accepted it because you ain't know nothing else to deal with. In fact, some of y'all, deep in your African spirit, told you this ain't cool. Right. And so you start singing a song to yourself. The failure's not in God, it's in me. The failure's not in God, it's in me. <laughs> inside you was telling you something about this ain't right. Yes, yes. But you made yourself adapt to the lie. Yes. And what's deep about it is when the lie doesn't work. That you think is the truth. And then the more you go through changes in your life calling on the lie to come and set you free, and you start going through more hell, you sing louder. The failure's not in God, it's in me. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. That's exactly what we've done. We've actually looked at each other and said, honey, you, only pro you ain't got any problems. All you need is faith in God. Buddy. Yes, the lie has been running all over the world for centuries, but guess what? I got something to tell y'all. Here come the naked truth now. Here come the naked truth now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the naked truth has finally caught up with the lie. And now the masses are starting to see the lie be undressed and it's deep y'all when you look at the lie and you say "Ooh, I thought you was the truth when you start seeing it for what it really is you start understanding the history of the people who gave you the lie in the first place yeah 
So understand, brothers and sisters, as I close, you are witnessing the undressing yes. of the best dressed lie yes. in history. Yes. Now, it, it, it's fitting for many of us. As I've heard many of you say, I knew something wasn't right. Uh -huh. yes. But you know what's even worse than that? Not so much us. The liar's children and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren are also starting to see that they lied. And because they realize that their parents made up this lie, in fact, the Roman Catholic Church can't hardly find nobody now to go into the priesthood. For two reasons. First reason is they ain't, they ain't buying the celibacy stuff too much. These young people ain't buying that stuff. I gotta do what? Nah, I don't think so. Nah, nah. And the second reason is because their youth are coming to grips with the reality that their parents misled the world. And they're taking it out on their own parents. That's why you see young white kids taking a gun and going up in their school and just start shooting at everybody because they're saying, you lied to me. What is there to, what is there to put my trust in? Mm -mm -mm. So now that you've come to understand that the truth is being, that the lie is being undressed, look at the person next to you and say, the rest, the rest. is up to you. Y'all you. You understand that? Yes. Don't put your faith, brothers and sisters, in a lie. Especially when you come to, the re to, come to realize how the lie has been put in place. Don't put your faith in that. That's what has held us down as a people. That's why we're in the condition we're in as a people, because we've been believing the lie. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. <laughs>